Hi there. This is Scholar Minor, a podcast about myth, magic, and occasional miscellany. My name is Ursula. I'm your host and fellow learning enthusiast. Well, folks, it's December, and if anything gets me into the mood for some salty yarns, it's stormy winter weather. Tonight, we'll be diving into the mythology of some half-human creatures of the sea, mermaids, sirens, and selkies. While this episode will focus on characters in Western mythology, human-animal ocean creatures turn up in folklore all over the world, so don't worry, we'll be revisiting this topic again at a later date. Chances are you're familiar with the classic Disney film The Little Mermaid, And with a name like Ursula, you know that I certainly am. Most people, when they think of mermaid, picture Disney's plucky heroine Ariel. Some folks may have heard in passing that the tale was originally written by Danish author Hans Christian Andersen. But that's where common knowledge of mermaids usually stalls, other than their image gracing the occasional calendar or forearm tattoo. Published in 1837, the original The Little Mermaid is a tragic fairy tale, certainly darker in tone than its animated namesake, but it still features our beautiful, lovelorn, fishtail protagonist. So who came up with mermaids? Was it Hans? Well, it seems strange women of the sea have been seducing, romancing, spooking, and unfortunately sometimes murdering ocean travelers for a very, very long time. Way back in 1608, English explorer Henry Hudson and his crew were on a harrowing icy voyage trying to find the Northeast Passage, an iceless route to Japan and China via the North Pole. While east of Greenland, Hudson received reports from two of his crewmen that they had witnessed a rather unusual visitor approach the ship. From the original source, as quoted in Hanvier and McCorristine, from the navel upwards, her back and breasts were like a woman's, her body as big as one of us, her skin very white, and long hair hanging down behind of color black. In her going down, they saw her tail, which was like the tail of a porpoise and speckled like a mackerel. Was there mermaid popping in for a visit, or was there something more sinister afoot? After all, the voyage was ultimately unsuccessful. But here we find this dubious sighting of a half-woman, half-fish, soberly recorded in an official ship's log. There is a rich history in seafaring of superstition and omens, practices that hold a lot of negative connotations in our modern, enlightened age. But dig a little deeper, and you'll find that superstition and watching for omens had, and has, a fundamental utility for the human brain. Let me explain what I mean, and let's take a brief step away from our maritime tales for some context. The worst thing in the entire world is worrying about a future outcome you have no way of knowing. Everybody has experienced this horrible feeling, whether you're waiting for a call from a job interviewer, for biopsy results, or watching a tragic situation unfold in the news. What will the outcome be? These days, you Google it, you check online medical journals or body language analyses, you look at statistics, weighing in your mind the chances of each outcome, and trying to comfort yourself, convince yourself, that you can be certain of the future. If that effort fails, sometimes even us modern folk fall back on superstition. You're waiting to find out a medical diagnosis, for example, and suddenly a billboard about it goes up on the freeway route you take home from work. Suddenly it's the only thing you can see on your commute, and the timing couldn't have been weirder, must be a sign. While many times these superstitions or omens were decidedly mundane, setting nets at an odd number, avoiding or encountering weather patterns, numbers of whales caught, sailors verbiage or even hair color, killing seals or birds, some truly fantastical omens began to make their way into the general seafaring consciousness. A strange light or an unfamiliar sound could portend something gravely serious and could be attributed to one of the ocean's many mysterious inhabitants. Consider the ghost ship, the Flying Dutchman, a phantom vessel with a cursed crew. Sightings of the Flying Dutchman may have had a meteorological explanation. A ship sailing far on the horizon in certain kinds of weather may appear to float above the surface of the water due to a refractive optical illusion. But whether or not it was paranormal or naturally explained, it was firmly cemented in the nautical mind that a floating ship was a harbinger of doom. So, what did the appearance of a mermaid mean to sailors? Usually, they were bad news, or at least kind of a bummer. Some historians believe that mermaid legends began with the Syrian and Parthian goddess Atargatis. She is very ancient, traced back in some form all the way to the Bronze Age, 
and was one of the most powerful and widely worshipped goddesses of antiquity. Via the Greeks, we are relayed a narrative in which Atargatis falls in love with a human man and becomes pregnant. Ashamed, she throws herself into the ocean, where she transforms into a fish with a woman's head. Though usually depicted in a fully human form in relief and sculpture, this particular tale took deep root nonetheless, and she is sometimes still referred to as the mermaid goddess. Musician and researcher Vic Gammon describes a ballad from the mid-18th century called The Mermaid, which tells of a ship's crew discovering a mermaid on a voyage who warns them of the loss of their ship and their untimely deaths. Her predictions, unfortunately, turn out to be accurate. This story is not alone. Mermaids seem to be fundamentally sad characters, with many stories related to lost love or heartbreak. Due, no doubt, in part to their morose undertones, they don't generally appear to be a positive sign when encountered by sailors at sea. And by the 19th century, mermaids were almost exclusively considered bad news, their reputation and folklore preceding them. Writer and poet William Sharp, who also used the pen name Fiona McLeod, published a poem in 1889 titled The Coves of Crail. Inspired by the folk tales of the Inner Hebrides, an archipelago to the west of mainland Scotland, this romantic and rather grim poem describes a young man's death after wandering into the sea to follow the song of a beautiful mermaid. Sound, sound he lies in dreamless sleep, nor hears the sea wind wail, though with the tides his white hands creep amid the coves of Crail. Don't read that one before bedtime, folks. Alluring behavior like this is where we begin to see their connection to their sinister sisters, the Sirens. In mythology, Sirens are unabashedly malicious, taking direct involvement in the deaths of seafarers, as opposed to the passive warnings and romantic appeal of mermaids. The most widely circulated descriptions of Sirens are provided in Greek mythology via Homer of the Iliad and the Odyssey fame. Sirens were half-birds, half-women, who sang mesmerizing songs to sailors in an attempt to lure them into dangerous waters, where their vessels would be destroyed. According to Homer, the Greek hero Odysseus, aka Ulysses, had an infamous run-in with these dangerously alluring creatures, escaping only by stuffing his ears and those of his crew with wax to avoid hearing the siren song. Odysseus took the additional precaution of having his crew tie him to the mast of their ship so he would be unable to steer them off course. As they traveled past, the sirens called out to him. Come here, they sang, renowned Ulysses, honor to the Achaean name, and listen to our two voices. No one ever sailed past us without staying to hear the enchanting sweetness of our song, and he who listens will go on his way, not only charmed, but wiser, for we know all the ills that the gods laid upon the Argives and the Trojans before Troy, and can tell you everything that is going to happen over the whole world. Here, we see the appeal of not only their beautiful song, but of the promise of knowledge of the future that would allow their victims some measure of control over their circumstances. Greek poet Apollonius of Rhodes also recounts a siren encounter in his Argonautica, where escape was only managed by the help of divinely talented Orpheus and the goddess Aphrodite. Another Greek poet, Hesiod, said that the song of the sirens was so powerful it stilled the winds. When vessels relied on the wind to keep them moving, the threat of the siren song is even more pointed when the elements themselves are under their influence. The most forlorn and comparatively benign of our creatures of the sea is the selkie, who is usually in the form of a seal, but changes into a human, or at least a humanoid being, by removing their skin. Less well known than mermaids and sirens in popular culture nowadays, the legend of the selkie has a rich history in Norse and Celtic mythology particularly in Iceland, Northern Scotland, and the Faroe Islands. While many tales describe silky women, silky men also have their fair share of legendary representation, and we'll examine both here. On a personal note, I have a lot of affection and nostalgia for silky stories. As a little girl, one of my favorite storybooks was The Selkie Girl by Susan Cooper, published in 1986. Featuring beautiful watercolor illustrations by artist Warwick Hutton, the Selkie Girl tells the quintessential Selkie legend. A man encounters an enchanting Selkie in her human form, and falling in love with her and wanting her to be his wife, steals and hides her seal skin to prevent her from changing shape. She bears him children that she loves, but is despondent and longs to return home to the sea. 
Upon finding her seal skin in its hiding place, she explains to her children that she has a family in the sea as well, and ultimately returns to them. In hindsight, it's a pretty heartbreaking subject for a children's book, with some pretty dark implications noticed only now in adulthood, given that the Selkie was kidnapped against her will, but as a kid I was enamored. It also stays true to its source material, as unfortunately many of these tales revolve around Selkies being unfairly coerced into human relationships. According to legend, Selkies lived in groups and would remove their seal skins to bask on the rocks. In human form, Selkies were beautiful to look upon, and it's when they are in a vulnerable state that we find humans stealing the hapless Selkie's skins before they can escape into the sea. Here is born that oft-repeated tale of the Selkie wife, or the seal wife, as previously described. The Faroe Islands version of the tale features a Selkie named Kapokanen, who has been immortalized in a truly breathtaking statue in the village of Mikladalor on the island of Kalsoy. In some versions, it's suggested that occasionally Selkies are relatively happy in their new landlocked life, and that returning to the sea is more of a primal urge than a conscious one, though this spin on the tale is certainly in the minority. In an oral Orkney version of The Selkie Wife, recorded on paper sometime around 1900 by J.A. Pottinger, we find the Selkie fitting into her new circumstances as best she can. It's written down phonetically, so I'll do my best. An bi misal, she was a strappin' lass and there was na her amal, old folks said, in the country. Natural enough, the young childer could not keep his een off her, and he, she did not seem to bear him ony bad will, for she could never bear to hae him out her sight. His old mitter, too, took an unso fancy to her, and was never tired or ruin her. It seems this particular Selkie not only got along with her husband, but her mother-in-law, too. However, her man was a careful to ha her old skilky skin lock it away, a muckle she kissed, and he never let her ken war the key o' twist, for she telt him herself it was better to keep her sulky days oot o' her mind. In the end, as with the others, this sulky returns to the sea, in this case stumbling upon her skin accidentally in a drawer. Though never seen on land again, this story assures us that when her children walk along the beach, she still swims along the shore and they can hear her call out to them. As mentioned earlier, sulky males make appearances in folklore too. Legend says that they appear as handsome youths and will come on land to keep lonely fishermen's wives company, occasionally fathering children before returning to their underwater home. Sometimes we do see sulkies portrayed in a different light. Some Shetland legends say that sulkies lure villagers into the ocean at midsummer. Sounds a bit like mermaids, doesn't it? And in post-Christian times, some folk theories attest that sulkies are fallen angels or condemned souls. Bringing us back to our omens discussion, it was believed by some fishermen and seafarers that killing a seal was a heinous deed, and that the selkies would curse you in your voyage for doing so. When it comes to strange and mysterious creatures, the ocean is certainly a crowded place, and we'll have to return again soon for another visit. But for now, I hope you enjoyed our brief introduction to some of the most well-known sea dwellers of legend. I encourage you to take a look at my sources for some further reading, They'll be included in the show notes, and I look forward to learning with you again very, very soon.